So, we looked at uh, the in last class the heat transfer in arc, right. So, how the heat is conducted, convected and radiated in an arc, right. It is extremely important to understand these three phenomena in an arc because that determines the, the action of shielding gas or how the heat is actually transferred from one point into other point in, in space as well as in time in an arc from uh, the, the cathode to anode, okay. So, in order to understand that we should uh, you know, look at uh, you know, uh, all the three aspects like conduction, uh, how conduction is carried out in the arc, like we looked at four aspects of uh, conduction, right. So, the, the conduction heat transfer coefficient is made of four components. The first component is the, the classical heat transfer by conduction due to the, the collision of uh, the atoms and molecules, okay. So, that is a classical heat transfer coefficient we looked at. The second is uh, the collision of electrons with these neutral atoms as well as the molecules that is K i or K e and then K i which is the diffusion of ionized pair, okay. So, we looked at uh, the four first is uh, the, uh, the classical uh, the, uh, I mean the heat transfer coefficient okay and then uh, the k i sorry k e which is the, the collision of electrons with the atoms and the molecules and then k i and the diffusion of ionized pair and then k d is is a diffusion of dissociated pairs okay if you use diatomic gas okay. So, so k g and then k e, k i, k d all these four together determines the conduction heat transfer in the arc. And we also looked at how the change in from say monoatomic gas to diatomic gas, how the arc temperature changes, is not it? If you use diatomic gas, you have a shouldering because the heat is effectively transferred, distributed and throughout the volume and due to that you know, if you look at from the arc center to the arc envelope, so that you will have a shouldering effect, okay. This shouldering effect especially you see it in diatomic gases because of the, the de dissociation, the heat transfer by the de dissociation. That means that dissociated gas can also go elsewhere and then combine becomes a and diatomic gas again. And during this process the heat is transferred, is not it? Similarly, we looked at the example, so this is N2 for and then N and such a shouldering effect may not be there because the de dissociation phenomena is not there, okay. So, this is very important to understand this phenomena because we are going to look at in this class when uh, the selection of shielding gases. So, how we can select a shielding gas because based on our heat input and arc uh, the characteristics, okay. So, apart from the, uh, the uh, conductive heat transfer, we will also look at radiative heat transfer, okay. Radiative heat transfer, what is the main assumption we made? The main assumption we make here in radiative heat transfer is the radiation coming out of arc is continuous radiation, okay. So, if you assume that it is a continuous radiation which is uh, very well valid at higher temperatures like in temperature what you took up in arc it more than 10,000 Kelvin, okay. So, the radiation can be continuous spectrum. So, in that case then we can use Stephen Boltzmann law to calculate the heat transfer by radiation. So that is what we looked at it right and we also looked at the characteristic typical uh, the spectrum of an arc. Okay, so, the, the arc looks bluish because the maximum intensity coming out of the arc is in the range of a blue spectrum, okay, the first 400 to 500 nanometers, the wavelength of the radiation, is not it? So, that is why the arc look bluish because the maximum intensity coming from the, the, uh, the wavelengths ranging from 400 to 500 nanometers, is not it? So, and then we looked at the convective heat transfer. So, how convective heat transfer can also effectively transfer heat from one point to other point in arc and this is also very important heat transfer mechanism especially if you use an, uh, low density gases. For example, helium, helium is highly convective gas, is not it? Helium is known to conduct uh, 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 con the uh, transfer heat much more effectively similarly to hydrogen as well because the convection is predominant and we looked at two major effects, uh, uh, major f the, uh, the effects uh, that can cause conductive uh, heat transfer is so, buoyancy flow, is not it? In convective, how does buoyancy flow happens? Because of density difference, okay. So, at uh, the center of the arc, the temperature is high, obviously, gases, uh, uh, the, uh, the density of gas reduces significantly, 
at higher temperatures. So, there will be density driven flow which is what known as buoyancy flow. Okay. And then apart from buoyancy flow, we also have a plasma jet formation, is not it? So, plasma jet formation is due to the, the electromagnetic forces that are generated. So, we always have all the charged particles like ions and electrons. So, even the two charged particles come close to each other. Okay, so, then what happens? Then uh, there will be repulsion, the repulsive force generated, which is known as Lorentz force, is not it? So, the force is inversely proportional to the distance between two particles. Okay, the smaller the distance, more the force. So, obviously, there will be accumulation of charged particles at the tip of the, the cathode, and obviously, if there is an accumulation of charges, then enormous amount of Lorentz force is generated. And this Lorentz force can push or can change the, the convective flow inside the arc and leading to heat transfer. Okay, so, that is a convective heat transfer due to the formation of plasma jet and plasma jet uh, it, it is very significant in, uh, uh, in, in welding in, in, uh, in welding arcs because the, the jet velocity can go as high as 200 uh, uh, meters per second. It is a huge. Okay, so, especially again if you use a convective uh, gases and uh, the heat can be effectively transferred and as well as uh, you know, uh, the heat the can be distributed much more effectively if you use convective gases. So, these are all the basics for selecting shielding gases uh, during welding. Okay, you cannot just like that go and okay, I will weld with argon. You cannot do that or I will just use GCU carbon dioxide. So, you need to understand how these gases effectively generate and transfer heat in arc, is not it? So, in, uh, unless you understand these things correctly, it is very difficult for you to choose a swelling, suitable shielding gas. So, in this class, we are going to look at how these phenomena would affect uh, the heat transfer and then the nature of the gases what uh, based on the ionization potential as well as the density as well as uh, the ionization uh, uh, characteristics or if it is monoatomic or diatomic and we can look at each individual gases and then uh, we can arrive at you know what gas can be suitable for what applications. Yes, is clear? Okay, good. So, we looked at all, the, all these things and then we went and looked at the typical schematic of the welding setup, is not it? So, the, what is the important characteristics of uh, an a schemat, a schematic I showed you? What is important factor is an arc itself is very important, right? The arc which actually generates heat that is the work force for us, okay? So, if you say arc then how do we ignite the arc? So, first process. So, we looked at thermionic emission. For example, thermionic emission emits the electron, but then uh, you have a schematic something like this. You have a power source okay, and you have a weld interface to be joined and then an electrode. Okay. It can be consumable or non-consuming. So, you connect the electrode and your work piece to the power source. Okay. So, we keep some distance from the electrode tip to the material. So, let us say for example, if it is D and then you send an uh, uh, shielding gas in this setup with a pressure say P. Would you ignite the arc just like that? You pass a current, the, the electric field in the circuit and the potential difference is generated by itself because you have circuit. But the arc will not be ignited just like that, is not it? So, either you need to heat up the electrode so high temperature so that you trigger a thermionic emission, is not it? But then enormous amount of current electrical field you need to send. So, now do you ignite the arc? Okay, so, we ignite in the welding arc by three methods. Okay, the first method is the ignition by electric breakdown. Okay. The second is uh, it is like thermionic emission by heating, by direct heating. But direct heating we do not use in a furnace 
or we won't use any external heating uh, source to heat the electrode. We already have a current and voltage, so we can use a simple joule heating mechanism. But again, so we modify the heating strategy by joule heating in such a way that we can reach the, the very high temperature at the tip of the electrode. So we will see how we can uh, end up heating the electrode at localized position at higher temperature so that we can trigger thermionic emission. And the third much, uh, method and also most commonly used method is high frequency ignition. Okay. So we look at uh, all these three, so what are these uh, three methods, how we ignite the arc. Okay. So the moment you go and start welding in, in a laboratory or in your workforce, first thing you do is you switch on the power source, gas bottle, open the gas bottle and then you ignite the arc. Okay, so let us ignite the arc okay. and we use arc for various purposes, right? various uh, in, in, uh, processes and we modify the, uh, the, the setup, but the main heat source is still arc, right? how you ignite the arc and what methods you transfer the heat that determines what are the welding processes you, know, uh, you can uh, invent. Okay, so for example, in if, if you uh, look at the all the arc welding processes, so we use arc, but the mechanism by which you generate the arc is different. As well as the schematic, the setup itself, you know, uh, different so that we can effectively transfer the arc heat to the workpiece. Okay, for example, in gas tungsten arc welding, it is a non consumer welding process, we strike an arc by using tungsten electrode. Okay. Or we can also replace the tungsten with a filler and then change the polarity so that you know you also melt the electrode and then you deposit the electrode to the, the welding base material. And then you can also convert the arc into plasma. Okay, so again the definition of arc and plasma which you looked at. So by doing some strategy, we can convert the arc into plasma so that we can increase the energy density of an arc. Okay, so then it becomes a, a, a power beam, the plasma beam. Okay, and then uh, the other welding processes, uh, they actually change the strategy of transferring heat from the arc. For example, shielded metal arc welding or submerged arc welding or flux code arc welding or electro slag welding and these uh, processes, again the heat is arc, but how you transfer the heat from the electrode, from the uh, electrode to base material that is different. Okay, so then we look at in all the processes and, and then how efficient all these processes, right? And then we'll move on to the uh, next welding processes. Okay, so before that, as I explain, what is ignition? So ignition is a condition. Okay, so that lead to emission of electrons from the cathode. Right. So once you have a sustained emission of electrons and these electrons will further will travel into the gas medium and subsequently they can ionize further leading to a conduction of electric field from one the cathode to anode or anode to cathode. Okay, so the ignition is to create a condition that lead to the emission of electrons from the cathode. As I said, and this can be done by three ways. So in all cases, ignition means we need to trigger the electron emission from the cathode. So we can either do by electric breakdown or direct heating of the cathode, thermionic emission, isn't it? Or we can also do by high frequency ignition. And all these three methods are commonly used. Okay, so if you look at uh, uh, load side mechanic. Before, uh, uh, yeah, uh, doing anything to ignite the arc, the mechanic would touch the electrode to the base material, isn't it? So, what does he do? Short circuiting. Because of that, what will happen? Okay, so we will see. So, he is using the second method to ignite the arc. Okay. So, the, the first method uh, which is actually uh, a bit tricky, but it is also used uh, um, widely uh, 
is by electric breakdown. So, electric breakdown works in the principle that the electrons are always available in the atmosphere. Okay. So, by various methods for example, photoelectric effect or cosmic radiation. So, it will always trigger uh, some electron emissions also in this room you may see some electrons are there, but the number of electrons will be much much lower. You always have some electrons are there. Okay. Suppose if you have the electrons in the system by cosmic radiation of photoelectric effect and you apply electric field, is not it? The power source applies an electric field, is not it? So, what happens then? And because of the application of electric field, the electrons which are there would start moving around. So, electrons would travel to anode and then during this process they also collide with the gas atoms, is not it? So, the electrons what you have in the uh, in the medium. So, when you apply an electric field these electrons which are created by this cosmic radiation or photoelectric effect and these electrons would travel towards anode and during this process they would collide with the gas atoms. Okay. So, upon collision if we, they keep on collide with the gas atoms the moment they gain a critical energy. Okay. So, what is a critical energy? Critical energy equivalent of the ionization energy of the gas, is not it? So, if the electron that electron which is actually there created by the cosmic radiation or photovoltaic effect and during this uh, uh, the influence of the electric field if they collide with the atoms they gain energy. Okay. So, suppose if they gain uh, energy equal to the ionization energy of uh, the gas which is there as a medium then it would ionize the gas atom, is not it? It is clear? Say for example, L is the electron mean free path okay? and you have a charge of an electron which is actually pushed to the anode by the electric field E. So, that is the total energy gain the electron get because of the applying, because of applying the electric field, is not it? A charge of an electron the electric field you apply and the mean free path right and if this energy equals to ionization energy then you trigger an ionization the electron would trigger an ionization is not it. So, now uh, the moment you trigger ionization then uh, the uh, another electron which is generated by this ionization process would again trigger another ionization is not it because the energy would be equal to the ionization energy the electron which is coming out because that is the energy gain is energy released, is not it. So, then there will be the avalanche of the ionization would takes place. So, the moment one electron triggers the ionization the other electron which will have equal energy of ionization energy. Okay. So, because what is consumed it is actually coming out and then that electron would create subsequent ionization and then the all the electron which are generated would create an avalanche, yes. It's clear. So now, so once you that phenomena avalanche happens, so obviously the number of electrons which are generated by this process, okay, so which is nothing but the potential difference between uh, uh, the the anode and cathode, and then the number of electrons which are actually created. Okay, so this is total number of electrons available for this action n is nothing but these electrons are pushed to a potential difference because potential difference which is actually pushing an electron from one end to other end, end right is not it. So, that is a proportional. So, number of electrons which are actually available okay, it is basically that is the proportional to the number of electrons which are actually created over a potential difference. Yes, it is clear. Yes or no? And this proportional constant is known as avalanche factor. Yes, so basically the number of electrons which are present in the system that is only is going to create an avalanche, is not it? And this avalanche is proportional to the the number of electrons which are pushed over a potential difference. 
yes, it's clear. So now, how do we now uh, trigger thermionic emission or emission from the cathode? So now, what will happen now? So we have ionization triggered by avalanche, isn't it? And if n is the number of um, electrons which are actually present, which is not, if you solve this equation, it will become c power alpha v, isn't it? So what what will be in the volume fraction of ions present? It is nothing but one minus n, isn't it? Or n minus one, depending on the value of the n. Yes or no? So it's nothing but so number of ions present in the system is so e power alpha v minus one. So both put together the n e plus n i must be one, right? Volume fraction, mass fraction, isn't it? Okay. So now, so this is the number of ions present in the system due to this avalanche reaction. Yes. So now, what will happen to the ions? Ions will obviously go to cathode, isn't it? So ions would obviously go to cathode. So the moment cathode goes, to, uh, the ions goes to cathode. Ions would start bombarding the cathode, isn't it? And during this process, when the ion bombards the cathode, you generate heat, isn't it? Yeah. So the, when the moment ion goes and bombards the cathode, you trigger the secondary electrons from the cathode. Right? So it's clear. And obviously, so moment the ions bombard cathode, you heat it up and it triggers thermionic emission and as well as the secondary electrons which are generated. Then what will you do? You strike an arc. Yes, it's clear. So the process is very simple. You already have some electrons due to the cosmic radiation and photoelectric effect. And these electrons are made to travel to anode by applying an electric field E. Okay? You apply an electric field E. The moment you apply electric field E, these electrons would start travelling towards anode. And during this process, they gain energy. Energy is E, small e, there is a charge of an electron times the electric field you apply and then mean free path L. If that equals to the ionization energy, when the, that electron which gains the energy equal to ionization energy, it collides with a gas atom it would cause an ionization, right? It is clear. So then uh, it will create an avalanche, number of electrons would be created and equal the 1 minus number of electrons of ions will also be created. Okay? So now these ions would reach the cathode. Unfortunately, not all ions which are generated will reach the cathode, is not it? Some will still be there in the arc column. So one factor would go. Okay, so that factor, if you assume that is gamma, okay, so this is the number of ions which are actually generated by avalanche. So assume that gamma is the factor which is actually reaching. So then, number of ions would reach the the, the cathode would be gamma times e power alpha v minus one, isn't it? It's just multiplication. Its fraction goes, isn't it? So now this defines the electron emission from the cathode because that is what you want, right? You need to emit electrons from the cathode, that is the ignition by definition. So these many ions would reach the cathode and bombard the cathode. So now the electrons will be released because of the action of ion bombardment onto the cathode, right? It is clear? Okay, so now we can derive an equation to calculate what is the minimum voltage needed for this action. Is ultimately that is what we need to ignite the arc. So if you say that this is the fraction of ions reach the cathode, the moment ion bombards the cathode, what will happen then I will actually explain, you heat up the cathode, not only heating up the cathode, you will also release secondary electrons, heating would release the thermionic emission. So once the electrons are released at cathode, then your definition arc ignition can take place. If you solve this equation, so obviously you would define a critical voltage for the emission of electrons from the cathode by the electric breakdown. 
okay. So basically so this factor alpha v minus 1 should always be greater than 1. So then if that is the case then you would trigger one electron you, you emit electron from the cathode okay. So you solve this equation you will get an, a critical voltage for this reaction that is known as breakdown voltage. So this is the minimum voltage you need to apply to ignite the arc okay. So suppose if you uh, want to ignite an arc not by direct touching because touching in, it's not always not always useful it shouldn't be doing it for all the welding processes so if you want to ignite the arc without a physical contact between the cathode and anode so you need to apply some breakdown voltage to trigger the ignition okay that is vb breakdown voltage okay so now we have a problem because i already taught you in the beginning our welding process is always done in extremely low voltages is not it the voltage is not more than 30 volts that is why it is making it safe is not it. So we can touch the welding table even welding is going on because uh, the welding base plate is also part of a circuit. Suppose if you want to apply high very high voltages to ignite the arc then you have a problem is not it okay. So now there are some power sources still ignite the arc using the breakdown voltage Vb and Vb has to be extremely high okay. So the Vb generally it is very high for example the Pd if it is one atmosphere pressure then it becomes D is not it. So one atmosphere pressure so this the factor Vb is actually a function of the distance which is the distance between the electrode tip to the base material okay and then the pressure. Suppose if you increase the, the D distance the Vb can also either increase or decrease similarly pressure as well. So the relationship if you look at the breakdown voltage versus P and D so there is a minimum at some point okay so if you go above this point okay you need to give very high breakdown voltage if you go minimum below this point you again you need to give very high voltage okay so ideally we try to aim for this range somewhere over here so that's why when you are doing welding the distance is very critical the arc length or the distance between the electrode tip and the base material otherwise you cannot ignite the arc you need to apply enormous amount of voltage right. So I told you in the previous lectures previous slides the distance between the cathode anode not more than 10 mm is not it. So because of this reason okay so if the D is higher you need to have very high voltage to strike an arc. Okay. Similarly, if you are increasing pressure, you also need to have very high the breakdown voltage or if you reduce the pressure, you also need very high breakdown voltage. Why is that? So obviously at low pressures, okay, the LNG gain of electron is very low because they may have a very high, very long mean free path. The collision, the probability for collision is less at low pressure. So then electrons cannot gain energy to trigger the avalanche is not it. Also in very high pressures the electron loses energy because of frequent collision. So in both ways the avalanche the probability decreases significantly okay. So if you keep the distance constant if you are doing it in a one low pressure and the one high pressure in both the cases the voltage will be very high there is a one global minima okay. If you keep the pressure constant again 
there is only very narrow range at which you can strike an arc okay so the breakdown voltage is a function of the pressure and the distance the d which is the distance between the cathode and anode tip so it's very critical because most of the cases pressure is constant unless we are doing underwater welding uh, hyperbaric welding uh, where you would encounter the issues in pressure so then uh, whatever you study whatever you do in room temperature may not be applicable at underwater okay so if you are diving at 100 uh, meters okay there only 10 meters in case of pressure at one bar okay so the 100 meters you will have a 10 bar of pressure so whatever you apply you derive an a uh, an, an heat input or you derive an uh, and the breakdown voltage so i want to apply say 1000 watts to ignite the arc it may not work do in, uh, down under water okay same with high pressure chambers for example okay so that's very important so we get the breakdown voltage by calculating uh, uh, the avalanche factors okay so the number density of ions and electrons which can be again calculated okay so then uh, we know that for a given pressure and given distance between cathode and anode so what will be my breakdown voltage so the power sources are capable of doing it if it is good enough so then what you do you do not ignite the arc before welding we will have one voltage peak okay so you switch on the power source if you want to ignite the arc by electric breakdown we will tell the power source okay arc ignition by electric breakdown then what will do before applying uh, the current voltage waveform it will have voltage is time one peak and then it will maintain and this peak is used for arc ignition but during this peak arc ignition you shouldn't be touching anything okay so then you will be killed instantly because if you look at now if the distance is higher the voltages will be close to 300 to 400 okay so then it is electric shock incident okay so now we if you our power source is capable of giving an electric uh, the voltage pulse and then uh, we apply a pulse to trigger the breakdown so once you trigger a breakdown you ignite the arc and then you can maintain the low voltage yes is clear and vb is as a function of shielding gas obviously why it's function of shielding gas because of ionization energy okay so if e is high so obviously the electrons should gain more energy to ionize isn't it so then obviously the breakdown voltage will also change based on the ionization energy right it's clear good so so it is a function of shielding gas and the distance between the cathode and anode and the pressure okay so under isobaric pressure conditions so you can take the pressure out the main functions which determine the breakdown voltage is your shielding gas and then the distance it's clear